Okay, it's over to you, Brian. Thank you, Frank. Uh, well, very good. So it's a real privilege to uh, present to such an auspicious group of uh, philatelists. Most of you I know, and uh, thank you for for being on the call. The uh, presentation is in two parts. The first part is uh, Australian mail robberies, and then everything else except aircraft crashes and wreck mail. Um, I did have <laughs> 237 slides, and uh, uh, Gary quite rightly pointed out uh, that that was uh, too many. Uh, so we're down to a more respectable number. So we should be finished within the hour. Uh, robberies. The reason I got interested in robberies was I was looking, researching for information on a couple of covers that were marked, uh, recovered from mail robbery in Victoria, an 1851 and an 1856 cover. Uh, I, I attempted to get uh, one and was beaten to it by um, uh, Steve Berlin from Baltimore. And the other one is owned by uh, a Victorian person who said there was no way on earth he was going to sell it to a POM. So that was the uh, end of my uh, end of that. Uh, Fortunately, after the book was published in 2011, I did get another cover, which was a proper um, uh, Bushranger cover. So that started off my interest, the fact I couldn't find any information. So I talked to Jeff Kello in 2009. And Jeff said, uh, well, the problem is that a lot of the records were destroyed. And that was clearly why I could only find uh, references in the PMG's report to uh, Parliament uh, each year. And those references were very brief and it turns out largely inaccurate. So there was no information. So that was why I started researching and published the book in 2011, having uh, identified 433 mail robberies. Uh, by armed bushrangers, uh, which I found quite staggering because there were only two covers um, uh, in, survived. Not only that, those two covers were actually not proper uh, robbed by bushrangers because they both involved collusion between the postboy and the uh, criminal. So <clears throat> it was only in 2014 that I was fortunate in an, an American auction to find an 1866 cover, which was uh, a true Bushranger cover, robbed by Bushrangers. We'll see that later. So uh, we'll start off with the next slide, uh, uh, Frank, please. Uh, the Beechworth, Beechworth mail robbery. So a lot of this is uh, peripheral uh, material. Uh, this was a letter regarding the uh, horses that were used in uh, a mail uh, robbery. Um, and uh, the uh, Paddy uh, Farrell, um, was uh, one of the culprits, uh, alias McCarthy, uh, and he was arrested. And this letter refers to that um, uh, that event. Uh, James Williams uh, turned on his uh, accomplices, and uh, hence they uh, they were caught. Uh, Williams got a reduced sentence. Uh, the the penalties for um, robbing the mail were pretty severe. 
it was usually hard year, uh, hard labour on the roads, and uh, an average uh, sentence was ten years. So if they survived that, they did well. Uh, so this letter uh, was from the Goulburn police to the Beechworth police. It described the horses that were stolen. So it's merely a, a reference to the robbery. It isn't the robbery itself. So next slide, please, uh, Frank. You're not asleep, are you? Oh, no, good. no, it's my... <laughs> okay. The Murrumburra mail robbery. Um, this was between Binalong, Murrumburra and Wagga Wagga. Wagga. Um, Jacob Marx had the contract, uh, which ended at the end of 1864, and he it was four days a week. George Hunter, the male man, or actually male boy, had left Murrumburra for Binalong on the 15th of October 1862 and was at Rocky Ponds when he said he met two armed men on horseback who robbed him um, and uh, in the mail was a way bill for these five for five registered letters um, and that was one of the items that was uh, opened by the uh, allegedly opened by the two men on horseback next slide please The uh, way bill, uh, when it was recovered, was endorsed, <clears throat> recovered from Murrumburra mail robbery. Yeah. But the interesting thing <clears throat> was that the mail boy had previously been, he was, he was in, brought to court on suspicion of uh, either collusion or being the person who robbed the mail and was cleared. But interestingly, two two months earlier, the um, uh, the guy had been um, acquitted of a similar offence. Uh, again, he was discharged for lack of evidence. So a bit of uh, a bit of a grey area. Anyway, this way bill was originally in the uh, collection of Norm Shepherd, and. Due to the intermediation of Barbara Hancock, I was able to obtain it. So thank you, Barbara. Uh, it's, it's not a cover, but it is an item recovered from a mail robbery. So next slide, please, Frank. This is uh, one of my favourite items, the Lapston Hill mail robbery. Um, held up at Lapston Hill by three masked men. There were seven passengers, three of them Chinese. Uh, the uh, Robert, two, two of the uh, bush rangers, I'm calling them bush rangers. <clears throat> Most of them were not bush rangers. They were simply criminals who'd been uh, born in Australia, but they hadn't escaped from. Uh, incarceration. So the two, John Foster and George Gibson, <clears throat> and another, robbed the mail, uh, which um, turned out to be a, a very lucrative uh, event because there was over a thousand pounds worth of uh, material uh, uh, stolen, including 25 ounces of gold. Well, we all know the gold price. So uh, there was uh, in Australian dollars, I, I would think something like um, uh, 75,000, uh, is that right? 75, 3,000 dollars an ounce, something like that. So that would be uh, 75,000 dollars, a lot of a lot of gold. Um, and the three uh, Chinamen were. Gold prospectors. Uh, one had 
400 pounds in banknotes, which was a staggering amount of money in 1862, uh, 1864, uh, and the other two had 50 each, so 500 pounds in banknotes. And then there was 895 pounds in uh, effectively checks, what we call checks, and uh, uh, other uh, trinkets from the uh, the seven passengers. Well, <clears throat> eventually, um, well, not eventually, uh, Foster was caught the next day in Sydney. They, they, some of them weren't the brightest bunch, and they would go to a, a, a house of um, a, a pub or somewhere where they could get a drink. Uh, to to spend the money and, and often flash it around. So many were caught in that way. George Gibson escaped. George Gibson, and I have it here from my book, George Gibson, alias Paddy Tom, alias Carrington, alias Paddy, alias Tom, was arrested being one of the perpetrators, but was tried for a murder which had occurred before, and uh, it eclipsed this uh, offence. Gibson was arrested in Queensland in February 1865, tried at Bathurst Circuit Court on the 15th of April, found guilty of murder and hanged on the 20th of May 1865. So, all in all, um, except for the... Uh, more experienced, better armed, and better equipped with horses, bush rangers. Uh, most of them got caught, or killed, or shot. So uh, that, for me, is one of the most interesting items of ephemera. In that the letter says, this letter had been scattered. The the letter was written by the. Um, recipient to the sender. This letter had been scattered with others at Lapston Hill, but contents seemed to have passed the notice of Knights of the Road and were forwarded in a very dilapidated condition, but money safe. So there was one pound four shillings in cash in the letter, which the bush rangers overlooked, having already got about five over 500 in cash. Next slide, please, Frank. This is, in my um, view, the only proper recorded cover from a male robbery by an armed bushranger. Um, note the uh, incorrect spelling of male. Um, this was... Uh, a guy called Alexander McPherson, who carried out a series of robberies in 1865 and 6, uh, 14, I believe. Um, and uh, ev eventually was caught. The interesting thing was that when he was caught and uh, went to uh, court, he was asked by the judge if he'd any comment before he passed sentence. And McPherson said, well, Your Honour, by the way, he was literate, very unusual, but he was literate. He said, Your Honour, I never killed or harmed anyone. The judge was singularly unimpressed and sentenced him to uh, a very long spell in jail. What was quite fascinating was that locals, businessmen and others in Queensland lobbied for the sentence to be reduced, and it was. And uh, in the event, uh, McPherson uh, was released early from jail due to this um, uh, feeling of the locals, set up as a farmer and was reasonably successful, except he was thrown from a horse and killed um, 
after uh, a, f a few years of farming. So interesting. The cover is obviously it was torn open. That damage is, was caused by McPherson. Um, but in my view, the only true uh, uh, cover from a bush ranger. Next uh, slide, please, Frank. Uh, yes, this is uh, <laughs> this is one of two looted by Boas covers I've got. This one from New South Wales. I've had it a long time. I can't even remember where I got it. But what attracted me was the cachet recovered from the mails looted by the Boas on June the 8th. Well, as June the 8th was my birthday, is my birthday still, uh, I thought, well, I've got to buy that. So I did. Uh, last Late last year, another one turned up from South Australia. Uh, and that's the next slide. Um, but uh, again, an interesting story in that uh, the uh, General De Wet uh, captured... Um, the mail uh, captured uh, Rudeval Rail Station on the 7th of June. So this mail was actually looted on the 7th, so the cachet is wrong. Um, and there, were, there was a staggering amount of mail for the troops, 2,000 bags. Most were burnt, but a few surviving items were, re were recovered. Interestingly, De Wet permitted the captured uh, uh, military to join with his own guys in going through the mail and taking out the valuables. Most unusual situation. Um, so uh, there are six covers uh, cover recorded from Australia with his cachet. I've only been able to find uh, illustrations from five of them. Uh, the, there is allegedly one from Victoria. If anyone knows where it is, please let me know. Uh, so there were two from New South Wales. And uh, could we have the next slide, please? Uh, one from South Australia, uh, one from Tasmania, uh, how many is that? Two, three, four, one from Queensland and one from Western Australia. Um, so just the six caches. There's a, 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 a an illustration of, at the time, uh, drawing at the time of the uh, uh, going through the looted mail. One from South Australia was redirected to London. Um, there are probably um, others who feel that this cover should be in their collection. And don't worry, because um, it, it's possible that in... The, I am over 80, so it's possible that in the near future it may, uh, it may be available for acquisition. Uh, next uh, slide, please, Frank. Another famous uh, post office uh, robbery. Um, this one uh, where the Ballarat post office was broken into over the weekend. Um, culprits not caught. Um, all the uh, surviving examples have been um, auctioned by Gary Watson in one um, form or another, whether through uh, um, prestige or uh, abacus or whatever. Um, the, <clears throat> the authenticity is not just the cachet. As you can see how badly, it's, how roughly it's been torn open. This was often the case with mail that was robbed. Um, as, uh, according to all the newspapers I was able to look at over the next year, uh, the culprits were not caught. Um, 
but uh, three covers are recorded. Uh, nice cachet. Next uh, slide, please. This occurred in the UK, of course, uh, recovered from uh, a stolen uh, mailbag uh, in Warwickshire, uh, recovered from stolen mailbag cachet, but addressed to Australia, the only one as far as I know. Uh, printed matter, so halfpenny rate. Um, and uh, on <clears throat> uh, printed stationery of the Ceylon and India General Mission with a map of India, robbed in and eaten, posted it to Australia. Interesting. Uh, next one, please, Frank. Uh, yes, this turned up recently in st status. There were two, one uh, in Queensland and one in South Australia. And uh, Martin Walker and I, between us, uh, acquired both, uh, accompanied by a letter referring to the robbery. And uh, once again, the post office uh, expressing regret for the incident, as was par for the course. Uh, next slide, please. Robbed from Papuan Air Transport Limited, uh, registered, so obviously considered it would contain valuables. Um, the bag contained uh, treasury notes to the value of £3,000. Uh, that was the, the registered mailbag which uh, in 1964 was quite a lot of money. Um, so uh, this has a manuscript uh, notation on the back, uh, but uh, not required for authenticity given the label that was uh, attached. The mail... The notice refers to the robbery being late September. Uh, it wasn't. It was uh, very early September. Next slide, please. The famous, now the infamous King's Cross mail robbery. Uh, I know there's at least one other cover from this uh, incident which Martin Walker has, um, and absolutely authentic because of the additional cancellation and the uh, damage by mail robbery. So uh, Martin Walker's uh, example is illustrated there. Thank you, Martin. There may be others, but I've never seen one. Uh, Martin pointed out that uh, research was quite difficult, that Trove was no assistance because Australian journalists were on strike at the time. So, ne next slide, please, uh, Frank. Yes, this was, um, this cover was held for six years uh, due di and, and inscribed in hand Delay of six years regretted due to this envelope having been stolen, recovered, and appearing as a court exhibit. It's 4th of March, 1987. Um, so it was cancelled 1987, but it was held for six years by the court, by the uh, officials. Um So, um, again, an apology that the court held the letter for so long. Next uh, slide, please. Mail stolen from a uh, transit van. Another example has been recorded. Another label attached explaining 
the delay, the, the, the van was stolen. So effectively, the mail was stolen. So this is a stolen cover, um, uh, but it's not in the stolen, because it was the van that was stolen. So it's not in the, the mail robberies section. One other example recorded addressed to Queensland. Uh, next slide, please, Frank. See, I gotta get the other slide. Other incidents next. That's saying. the end. That's the end of uh, robberies. Uh, so, what are we going to do? Are we going to do questions now, if any, for robberies? Yep, they're what? I didn't hear that, but if anybody's got any questions, yeah, now's Brian, the time. I do. Um, yes. I believe uh, Purvis had a half-length cover and it's got recovered from mail from the robberies. Is that the one? Is that one of the yes, two? Yes, that that's the 1851 collusion? cover. That was Purvis. Yes. Yep. Penny and Threepenny half-length on. Yeah, I thought it was a little bit later, but I, it's... Um, so that's oh, no, that the... was the 1856 one yep. because the 1851 is owned by a guy in Victoria. I think I think I was wrong way around. I think his was the age. but yes, he had one of them. Yes, Ian, you you probably know about that. I'll find I'll find you a picture of it by the time we come back to the next bet. Mm -hmm. oh, I've got nice. Purvis's original page. Okay, thanks. I'll but is that anyway. a Bush Ranger cover, Brian, or is that one of the ones where there was collusion between the male collusion? collusion. Even the Purvis one was collusion between the male robbery, okay. male robber, and the postboy. Gotcha. Next, uh, next slide, please. We're on other incidents. Uh, eighteen forty-one. Um, uh, 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 somebody in um, uh, Geelong wrote to somebody in the UK, but didn't stamp the letter. So when it got to the UK, the uh, General Post Office in, in London sent a printed letter back to Mrs. Thomas in Geelong saying, um, this uh, is underpaid. Please arrange to call at the post office uh, in St. Martin's, St. Martin's Le Grand and pay the eightpence, and then we'll forward your letter. So a couple of months later, that got back to uh, Victoria. And then one can assume she either ignored it completely and wrote another letter or um, sent a letter with the eightpence or wrote to someone in London to ask them to call in and pay the eightpence, but either way, the whole exercise um, took, uh, you know, getting on for a, a year, quite a, an extraordinary situation, um, all because she forgot to prepay. Uh, so, interesting item. Uh, next item, please. The advertised, of which I've written about, um advertised de advertised december um there are uh, about half a dozen of these advertised marks recorded uh december june and july are some of the dates um i believe gary's is july or june i, I can't remember yeah um so um, the uh, letter was stamped, advertised, and then advertised in the uh, South Australian Register. Um, as we can see, his name is at the top in the middle, in the uh, 8th of January um, South Australian Register. Uh, obviously, in that case, the letter was claimed because there's no unclaimed mark on it. Uh, two of the 
examples have unclaimed hand stamps, which uh, indicate that uh, the person didn't come forward and it wasn't claimed. Next slide, please. Here's uh, one with the unclaimed mark uh, for July. Uh, again, the um, on the top line, uh, Mr. Williams, right at the beginning, uh, were, it was advertised uh, the, the following month in August. It was not claimed and it got the unclaimed hand stamped. There are two versions of that unclaimed hand stamp. The smaller one uh, is on a letter uh, owned by um, the gold escort cover owned by um, Pat Grimwood Taylor. I don't have that and I will never get it because she's much younger than I am. Uh, next slide, please. Ah, detained on board ship. Yes, Victoria and Sydney. Melbourne and Sydney employed detained on board of ship or detained on board ship uh, uh, marks uh, to absolve the post office of uh, uh, blame for late delivery, even though that late delivery may have been just one day or even hours. Uh, there were serious penalties for captains of ship who held mail uh, beyond um, that they had to hand the mail in immediately that was the a really big priority and they would get uh, a penalty of up to 10 pounds a letter for not doing so although in practice the amount levied was rarely more than 10 pounds so uh there are 12 examples recorded of the detained on board of ship um, uh, at Melbourne. Um, Ian Gregg has one of those. Uh, and uh, I've got a few. Uh, next slide, please. And this is the Sydney mark. Uh, detained on board ship. Um, there are four examples of the Sydney mark recorded. Uh, Gary Diffin has one. Uh, we both went after it, but he got it <laughs> in an obscure New Zealand auction. Um, uh, there are a couple of those marks in archives, but only four in private hands. <laughs> um, the Bosphorus uh, was not offloaded. The mail was not offloaded until uh, the 8th of May, which was the day after it arrived in Sydney. I think what happened was the vessel was carrying uh, 20, uh, 30 tonnes of mail from the UK, a vast amount, and called in at Adelaide to, um, uh, I think, to uh, get some more coal because it hadn't, it wouldn't have made it through to uh, Sydney. And as it called in, it picked up mail, as was the normal case. Yeah. So a few letters from Adelaide were collected uh, and no doubt 30 tonnes of mail from the UK was offloaded straight away, and this was overlooked, um, hence the detained on board ship mark. Next slide, please. Another of the Sydney marks, um, I, I've written about this in various journals, uh, the uh, Ma Magister's Brig Phantom was... Um, travelling from Melbourne to Sydney and uh, the uh, uh, writer um, was the Phantom's commander write, writing to his wife uh, in Sydney. He attached um, a, a stamp, a, a Victorian stamp, uh, which was the correct rate, um, but... Uh, 
for some reason, when it got to Sydney, it was uh, not accepted and so uh, was charged, uh, threatens um, incoming uh, ship letter rate uh, and rece received the detained on board ship because once again, it was uh, not um, handed in uh, immediately. It was actually taken to the post office a month after the vessel arrived, which is uh, pretty poor do, but I doubt that he would have been fined. No record. Uh, next uh, slide, please. I was fortunate to obtain this from the Ron Butler sale. Um, it's got two disinfection slits. Uh, it was related to a cholera outbreak in Egypt. And uh, this uh, went uh, uh, via Bologna and uh, received uh, postage dues and uh, the two disinfection slips. Uh, postage dues because the letter rate from South Australia was eight pence at the time, not um, uh, six months. So, terms under payment, 20 centesimo. Um, good, next slide, please. Frank. Next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, yeah, Martin, one of Martin Groom's favorite covers, which um, is uh, in my collection rather than his, um, sent uh, from uh, uh, Swansea to uh, uh, Astra, it uh, was being carried by the mailman when uh, he was drowned uh, crossing the uh, South Esk River. Um, tragically, uh, the, uh, the guy obviously knew he was taking a huge risk getting across the river uh, and he tied the mailbags to the seat of the mail court cart, knowing it was a dodgy trip. Um, so endorsed this envelope and closed the letter which was on amongst the mail when the carrier got drowned. Um, very sad, um, but a very uh, unusual uh, postal um, uh, memorial to to this guy. Next uh, slide, please. Uh, gate locked, uh, so postman couldn't get in. Um, on the 23rd of May, uh, and it was stamped the 23rd of May, but presumably it was stamped again um, Stamped at Fitz Fitzroy on the reverse, but when it was actually delivered, I don't know because the, the um, Melbourne and the Fitzroy date are both May 23rd. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, one of the uh, USA covers that was. Uh, recovered from um, a fire on a mail train uh, addressed to uh, from um, Brisbane to Canada. Um, I've not seen another one from Australia. There are others within the USA, 
but uh, un unusual. Uh, next, please. One of my really favourite covers, um, the uh, 1899 um, Cyclone. Um, I, I researched this quite a bit. At the time, it was considered uh, a pretty serious cyclone. Um, but uh, given the scale of the damage and the height that the water went up the cliffs, uh, it's been reassessed as the uh, most intense cyclone recorded in the Southern Hemisphere, full stop. Um, if that had occurred today, there would have been, I suspect, thousands of deaths, but it occurred um, 125 years ago, and there were only th about 300 deaths. One of those who died was Mr. R. B. Murray, the owner of the uh, schooner Sagita, uh, to whom this was addressed by our friends in uh, Hobart. Um, it's marked deceased, drowned in hurricane and various cancellations uh, on its way uh, there and back. Um, really a, a tragic incident, um, a miracle that not more were um, drowned, uh, but Interestingly, the uh, animals and the um, Aboriginals, apparently, um, a lot of the Aboriginals got up on high ground, uh, but uh, a, a lot of people, including Aboriginals, were killed. So um, his ne the, Murray's nephew, Al Alfred Outridge, and his nephew, Harold Outridge, were also aboard and drowned. Next slide, please. Fire at Broken Hill Railway Station. I know there's another example. I'm not sure if Martin has it. Oh no, it's not. It's not um, South Australia. No, he won't have it. Um, damaged by fire at Broken Hill Railway Station. Uh, list of the mail that was on the van is there. Um, the cause of the explosion and fire was petrol coming into contact with uh, a spark. Uh, next slide, please. Another train fire, this one in uh, Washington, USA, a similar type of label applied. This one to Perth, four examples recorded. One to Melbourne, one to Perth, couple to China. Um, yes, damage caused by the fire and by the water used to extinguish the flames. Next slide, please. Mystery one. I got this in, uh, I'm pretty sure it was a prestige auction a long time. Yes, I'm sure it was, uh, of course a prestige auction a long time ago, damaged when landed at Darwin. It's oil stained. It's uh, It was underpaid, hence the um, double uh, deficiency uh, uh, on the reverse and a couple of the strikes. Never seen another one. Um, and... Uh, I've searched uh, all the newspapers, all the records I could. No record of any incident. Um, so one of those mysteries. Uh, next, please. Yes, the, these two marks came up in different auctions at different times. Um, quite extraordinary really uh, the only two I've ever seen I 
did an article for the Samoa Express, um, the Journal of the Fellowship of Samoan Philatelists. No one else has seen one, but the um, mail from uh, Apia missed the connection. Um, uh, at uh, Pago Pago, and um, they they obviously made up a hand stamp because there was so much mail. Um, yet only two um, are recorded. Quite unusual. Um, and if none of the Samoan lot have seen one, then probably these are the only two both from completely um, different sources. Uh, remarkable. Next slide, please. Uh, this is uh, a traditional quarantine cover. Martin Walker is to thank for any information, I'm sure. Um, because he's the, in my view, the expert on uh, Australian uh, quarantine mail. Um, oh, I've said information from Martin Walker. So, yes, yes. Um, so, thirty bags of mail involved. Uh, there are others. I've seen others in auction. So, nothing particularly special other about that. Next, please. Uh, yes, the Quetta earthquake mail is not uncommon. There, there's quite a lot of it about. It's not all that common addressed to Australia. Um, I know of three covers addressed to Miss Goodall in Sydney from the uh, Quetta event. Uh, there's another one to Mrs Clayden. So there are at least four addressed to Australia, and I'm sure somebody's got another. Uh, it, those can't be the only four. Uh, it was a pretty serious earthquake, as as you re well you won't remember because it was 1935. Well, somebody might. Uh, Thirty to thirty sixty thousand people died. Pretty. Loose estimating there. Um, next, please. Volcanic eruptions at Rabaul. Uh, again, this was from a, I think, a prestige auction. Um, yeah, most of this stuff was, which is understandable because Gary gets to deal with most of the interesting Australian mail. Uh, so this was not accepted for aerial transmission as it was registered and it hadn't been prepaid. So it was sent by the Montero, reached Brisbane on the 17th of uh, uh, June and uh, Adelaide on the 21st of June, three days later. Uh, yeah, next, please. Post office fire in Queensland uh, at Laura Post Office. Um, excuse me. Um, from Cairns to uh, Brisbane, from Laura to Brisbane via Cairns with a type slip, uh, partly destroyed by a fire. No explanation as to what caused the fire. That's the only example recorded. Next slide, please. Unknown cause received in bad condition at Honolulu. Quite, uh, I've seen this uh, cachet uh, on many covers. Uh, some stamps missing. Uh, even so, there's still a, 
for 10 shilling roux and a two shilling roux. Um, uh, Lawrence Kimpton thought this in cover was interesting, uh, but I've not been able to establish the uh, cause of the uh, damage. Next cover, please. Post office van fire at Sydney. Um, I think I've seen another of these, but not common. 1938, article about the 8,000 letters being burnt and some being recovered. Um, yeah, ni nice items. Next, please. Fire in the letterbox at Kingsford Post Office. Um, another example recorded with the forwarding envelope. Um, well, of course, fires in letterbox are caused by uh, vandalism. Somebody has put a match or a lighted cigarette in. Next, please. These two uh, were delayed by eight years. I've seen uh, others. Um, they they were held um, until after the war. Why they were held till 1948, I'm not clear. Um, delay in receipt due to wartime conditions. Uh, Amsterdam... March 1948, that, that's the translation, delay in receipt due to wartime conditions. A couple of them obtained separately. Um, one definitely from Gary's auction <laughs> yet again. Um, next slide, please. Uh, that's a shipwreck, shouldn't be in there, um, but it's... Uh, it's from Australia and was wrecked on the, lost on the VDAR, um, which was sunk by a U boat. Uh, nothing particularly special. Next, please. Captured on the high seas. I've only got seven minutes left. Um, this was. Uh, Normally it ends up in a prize court, but this was apparently released um, as it has no Admiralty Marshall's number. Um, so, um, um, interesting. Next, please. This one hidden for five years in Paris during the occupation. And then a label was attached in New York when it got there. Six... Um, of these labels uh, are recorded. Um, interesting, it's from Numair. Uh, uh, next, please. Oh, and to Kessler, Kessler, the philatelic dealer. L relate, 1942 related to HMAS Perth, um, presumed lost at sea, tragic uh, incident because... Um, over half the um, crew were lost uh, and uh, a further 102 died in captivity. Uh, next, please. Uh, yes, this was uh, used in 1942 because of a lack of paper, so an old cover was reused. Next, please. Uh, parcel lost by uh, enemy action, uh, letter to uh, uh, Henley Beach, um, to Grange at least. Uh, next, please. All right. Damaged by rodents, gnawed at the left by rodents at the in the hold of a ship, surface mail. 1945, next, please. Delayed by war. Um, that's apparently the translation. Um, 
Del delayed mail. Next, please. Mail vampire in Tasmania uh, with an article. I would think there must be more, but I've never seen another um, letter and newspaper article. Next, please. GPO trailer fire in UK. Um, letter from the Sydney Post Office. Next, please. Damaged by rats awaiting transit. The only example recorded. Again, that came from a, a Gary auction, of course. Damaged by rats while awaiting transit. Uh, registered branch. So that was retained because probably because it was registered. Uh, next, please. Letter receiver. Not uncommon. Plenty of those about. Next, please. And more. And again. Next, please. Row car fire in Tasmania, um, 1959. Um, I think I've seen another of these. Uh, next, please. Caught in safe door in Tasmania. Uh, so the letter was delayed in delivery by one day. Plenty of authentication on there. Next, please. Uh, another firing letter receiver. Nothing special. Next, please. Mail van fire following an accident. Uh, at least five examples uh, are recorded. Uh, I've seen. Uh, I've seen three of them. Next, please. Train fire in the USA yet again. Um, two caches um, and addressed to Victoria from the Association of American Railroads, which is rather ironic. Next, please. Ah, uh, the fire at the Melbourne Mail Exchange. Quite a bit of this mail about. Um, yeah, three million articles uh, a day. Were, and also a huge amount of mail was lost and uh, quite a lot was uh, recovered and uh, forwarded with caches. Next, please. More caches, more mail. Same incident, 23,000 letters recovered. Next, please. And more. Next, please. Delayed by compliance with post office guide. Um, address to Israel. 1970, um, quite a lot of that mail about, all to the same addressee with the same uh, uh, miniature sheet. Next, please. Nineteen, yeah, the floodwaters, I'm not sure if that's a private mark. I've seen others. 1984, harassment from dog, Tasmania. To be the householder, no mail delivery due to harassment to postman from dog being loose. Well, uh, quite right too. Next, please. Right. In 1975... <laughs> My wife received a letter 
saying it's been reported that on the 10th of March 1975 at New Leward Avenue, you were the owner of a dangerous dog which was not kept on under proper control. Sam, on the left, being held by my ex-wife Jill in 1973, was the culprit. He bit the postman for the second time and had to be returned to his owner. So it just shows that um, uh, Postman's Lot is not a happy one. Muttley, on the right, however, was my favourite dog of all time. He never bit the postman or anybody. Um, but Jack Russells are notorious. So it's now 10 o'clock. Do you want to, it's now uh, 9 o'clock. Do you want to finish there, Frank? Yes, we can uh, finish Gary, there. That's the hour. Yeah. Over to you, Gary. Yes, um, I'm just amazed at the number of incidents and the number of mail that's actually survived. Um, the one thing that did intrigue me was the um, there's some of these hand stamps I do have is the tracing of the cholera outbreaks in the 1870s and 1880s. I've looked at this for a number of different outbreaks and a number of different Very locations. Sure. And some of these I've heard of, but I've never been able to prove that they've actually happened. And I haven't been able to find anything online. And I've got covers that have you know, got disinfection slits over a 10-year period. And yet um, I haven't been able to isolate them. So you know, no. if anybody's got information, I'll be happy to uh, have some. But... Um, we're going to go to uh, Martin Walker. He's going to be able to provide the, the vote of thanks for Brian tonight. Uh, thank you, Gary. It gives me a great pleasure to have been asked and to uh, pro propose this vote of thanks. Uh, Brian and I are obviously creatures of uh, like tastes um, because uh, we, we both like mail that's had something unusual happen to it, which uh, takes it out of the ordinary that uh, so many people collect. And the added um, satisfaction and enjoyment from researching these items and discovering their causes and discovering quite often, you know, the mere fact that they've survived and even the story of survival um, is is equally as fascinating. But, uh, uh, Brian, I worked out Brian and I first met at Sidpex in 1988, so that's 35 years ago now, Brian. And, 36. Uh, <laughs> yes. And, uh, and, and as was quite evident there, you know, Brian assists me with my research and my collecting, and uh, I do likewise for Brian. So um, with that, it's you, you'll see my name and a lot of his works, which uh, I, I just made a note here. I'm in the, uh, the Royal Society of Victoria has published, you know, two editions of the Rec Mail book, uh, Australasian Rec Mail. And just recently, Brian's finished um, another magnum opus, five volumes on Australian crash mail. That's five volumes. And so it's quite remarkable there. And he's probably one of the most prodigious writers on Australian philately um, ever, perhaps. Been writing, what, since the early 1960s um, for a multitude of magazines, most of all his uh, BSAP journal, Philately from Australia, of course, and even the London Philatelist. So... I think we're all very privileged to have someone as enthusiastic and keen as Brian um, for Australian philately to give us the ability to give us this, this presentation tonight. And I'd probably also say that probably Brian is one of the greatest supporters of Australian philately coming from overseas that I can think of, um, except perhaps maybe, maybe Chris Rainey's been here more times, you know, as, as a trader, but uh, certainly as a private collector coming to shows at their own expense, um, Brian would be number one. And for that, uh, I'm particularly thankful. And I think all the rest of us should be particularly thankful. And uh, I'd like to uh, lead the expression of that thanks uh, for everyone. So thank you. Thank you, Martin. Yep. It's a privilege. So um, uh, back to me again and uh, to the more formal part of uh, the display. Um, I still think the survival and the amount of incidents that you've recorded, Brian, it's just astonishing. And and as Martin says, the survival, how these things survived, um, it's beyond me, that's for sure. 
and then to be able to hunt them down, not only here but around the world, that takes a lot of dedication and a lot of research. Um, so it's a, it's a great tribute to the collection of that you've done, um, uh, assembled here. Um, I'm going to go to the formal part. Um, we have no more, um, no new, sorry, uh, membership applications. Although David Hanson, who's here, says he said yesterday that he wants going to join the Royal. Uh, I've got no announcements and no general business. Nobody's interrupting me for that. Um, the future meetings uh, for the Melbourneites, uh, we've got Tuesday the 5th of March is going to be me. And I'll be doing Australian colonial advertising covers to 1912. The Postal History Group, which will be chaired by um, uh, John Shawley, 7.30 p.m. They've got tourism. And then on the 21st of March, we've got another philatelic meeting and our friends from Brighton. That'll be a display by the three amigos. Um, can't remember who the amigos are, but there's three of them. And there's the library afternoon on the 30th of March. So if there's anything else from anybody, nobody is putting their hand up that I can see. Um, I'm going to declare the music, the meeting closed. Uh, I thoroughly enjoyed it. And it's, you know, you could actually do a social history around this type of exhibit. Uh, and it's not just related to philately. And, and this is how you get people who are outside our hobby and how we collect interested in what we do because they'd be thinking of the same thing how does this stuff ever survive so anyway uh that's it for me uh thank you for attending it was a great attendance it was 27 people it was really really good and i'm and it, what it does is that um you, you look around the room there's a lot of our interstate overseas members here and that's what the zoom's all about uh, once Frank's able to get his um, uh, audio visual guide to re to repair our um, Zoom stuff at um, uh, High Street at Purvis House, then every every meeting will be on Zoom. So that's to come. But um, the guy he's recovering from COVID, he's been hit pretty hard. Alrighty, thank you very much. I uh, hope you all enjoyed it and uh, look forward to seeing you all very soon. Bye. Cheers. Bye. Enjoy. Bye. Bye-bye.